The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 25, the 25th verse in the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Wherefore, putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We considered in general last uh, Sunday morning some of the general principles which uh, govern uh, a consideration not only of this particular injunction, but also of all the following detailed injunctions which the Apostle gives to these Ephesian Christians in the remainder of this letter. He is now really coming to the practical application in detail of what he has been teaching. And uh, we did uh, emphasize last uh, Sunday morning the all-importance of doing this. This is something that is emphasized everywhere in the New Testament epistles. It is not enough merely to grasp principles. They have to be applied. All that has been done for us in Christ has been done for us to deliver us from our sins, to deliver us from all iniquity, and that he might separate unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, we must maintain the order, of course, we must always start with our doctrine. We must always uh, see why the kind of thing the Apostle tells us in this verse we are looking at this morning is quite inevitable. There is no greater motive to holiness than an understanding of the truth. But it's obviously equally fatal to be content with a mere theoretical understanding and grasp of the truth. And to imagine that because we have an understanding, we have everything. There is no point in understanding the love of God in Christ in the atonement unless it has an effect upon us and teaches us to love. Not only to love God, but also to love one another. The gospel of Jesus Christ is intensely practical. But it isn't only practical. It is practical, as we saw for its own special reasons, which are always far removed and remote from the reasons which the world gives for its culture and its moralities and its codes of honor and of behavior. The reasons here are always peculiarly Christian. Very well, then let's look at this first detail injunction that the apostle gives to these people. You notice that his method is, I say, this. First of all, the negative injunction, putting away lying. Then the positive injunction, speak every man truth uh, to his neighbor. And then the reason for doing both, for uh, we are members one of another. Now, Surely the first question we all must ask as we come to this first of the particular injunctions is this. Why does he put this first? Why does he start with this? This exhortation to cease from lying and the positive exhortation to speak the truth one with another and to another. Now, there must be some good reason for this. And uh, therefore, it seems to me always, as a principle of Bible study, which we must never fail to apply, we must always remember in this way to ask our questions. These things are never done at random. They're never done haphazardly. The apostle didn't just put down the first thing that came to his mind. There, there's always a system here. There's always a reason. And if he puts one thing first rather than another, he's got a very good reason for doing so. So the first thing you see he puts at the top of the list is lying or falsehood. Falsehood in general. Because, uh, as we all know, 
unless uh, you can lie without saying a word. You can lie sometimes by not speaking, by allowing something to be said which you know to be wrong. You can lie with a look. So that the term lying really does cover falsehood in general. And so I ask the question, why start with falsehood and lying? Well, it seems to me that there are many, many reasons for this. The Apostle gives us one which, in a sense, sums them all up here in this verse. But let me divide it up and show you how the Apostle was, in a sense, driven to put this in the first place. Well, why then? Well, there is one reason which seems to me to be uh, almost a mechanical one. You remember what he's been saying in the previous verse, correctly translated, that he put on the new men which, after God, is created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That's the last thing he said. This is the character of the new men. That's why we put on the new men. He's been created anew after God, after the image of God, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Very well, he says. Now then, as you come to do this in detail, what do you start with? Well, this question of truth. Because this is the great characteristic, the most essential characteristic of the Christian life. This is the thing, if you like to put it negatively, that uh, makes the Christian life such a complete contrast to the non-Christian life, to the life of the world. The Apostle, you see, keeps on repeating these terms in describing uh, that uh, old man. He talks about him as being corrupted and being led to destruction by what? Well, by the lusts of deceit. And we saw that that is ever the greatest characteristic of the sinful life, its utter deceitfulness. But on the other hand, there is nothing that is so characteristic of the Christian life as the fact that, uh, well, it belongs to the whole realm of truth. That is why a very good way of describing what has happened to a man who has become a Christian is to say that he has seen the truth or he has seen the light. Everything that is the opposite of a lie and of darkness. That's what we claim, is it not, uh, for the gospel and for the Bible. This, we say, is truth. And nothing else is true. All other views of life and of men and of existence and of the purpose of life and death and what lies beyond, they're all lies. And therefore, we thank God that we've been delivered out of that realm of the, the, the lie. The world is governed by the lie. In every realm and department, it's all wrong. But here, we have been brought into the realm of truth. And we glory in it. It is the will of God, says Paul in writing to Timothy, that all men might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And as you know, in the first epistle of John, it is the thing that he there keeps on arguing repeatedly. That this now is the realm of truth. The darkness is past and the light is come. So clearly, everything about us should be indicative of the fact that we are now living in the truth and have arrived at a knowledge of the truth and are seeing the whole of life in a true manner. So naturally, having ended with the word truth, he takes it up again. And this, therefore, is the first thing that comes in, uh, therefore putting away lying. It's utterly incompatible with the realm to which you now belong. But uh, that, of course, leads us of necessity to other aspects of this matter. Is there anything, I wonder, that ultimately is a so vital and an essential part of the character of God as truth. Now, the Bible is full of this. Did you notice that extraordinary statement that the Apostle makes there at the beginning of his letter to Titus? God, he says, who cannot lie. 
God cannot lie. That is God. God is the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What a tremendous statement. There is one thing that God can never do. God can never lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible. It would be an essential contradiction in his very nature and being. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He cannot be tempted with sin, neither can he tempt anyone. God is essential, everlasting, and eternal truth. And to be a Christian means that we have been brought into fellowship with God. So you see, the apostle is bound to start with this. You see, when the apostle says that we mustn't go on lying, he's not interested in it as the moral, moralists are and the humanists. Doesn't just say, you know, lying's a terrible thing. Oh, well, of course, lying is a terrible thing, but this is the reason. We, we claim to be Christians. We say we've been reconciled to God. We say we know God. We say we are in fellowship with God and in communion with God. Very well, says the Apostle John again, if a man say, if he, I know him and keep not his commandments, he's a liar. It can't be true. It's impossible. You cannot at one and the same time walk in the light and in the darkness. And to know God and to have fellowship with God means of necessity. Truth. And truthfulness. Ah, David understood this. Even there with the light of the old dispensation, any man who had ever been in communion and contact with God knew it. That was the thing that troubled David after his most terrible sin. So he cries out of the agony of his heart in Psalm 51, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. He knew that no pretense, no sham, no lie can avail in the presence of God. He says, it's no use pretending, it's no use attempting to hide anything. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And if I'm not open here, he seems to say, and absolutely, utterly truthful, it's of no value at all. With men, we can do many things, but not with God. God demands, insists upon this honesty, this truth, in the inward parts. So naturally, at the very top of the list, you must have this thing with which the apostle starts, putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Very well, go on to the next. As it is true to say that uh, there is nothing that so represents God as truth and truthfulness. It is equally true to say that the devil is a liar and that that is of the very essence of his nature and of his being. Do you remember the Lord Jesus Christ saying that? You'll find it in the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, verse 44. Ye, he says to these Jews who are arguing and wrangling with him and objecting to the truth because it condemned them and searched them, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and a bird not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, you see, this is how the New Testament deals with a matter like speaking the truth and refraining from lying. We've got to see what it means and what it involves, not just for the sake of being a gentleman and being a man of his word and so on and being truthful. No, no, that's all right. The world can do all that. That's not Christianity. This is Christianity. We've got to see the thing in all its hideous, foul, vile character. And you can only do that as you put it into the Christian context. So that all the moralizing that passes in the name of Christianity is finally the greatest denial of Christianity. It does away, as I was indicating last Sunday morning, with its uniqueness. 
which is its central glory. Or take another statement. You remember the terrible case of Ananias and Sapphira. It had been agreed amongst those early Christians that they should sell their goods and their possessions and bring it to a common pool. It was quite voluntary. There was no compulsion. And a number of people had done this. And amongst them, Ananias and Sapphira, they had come and said, well, we've done what we promised to do and here are the proceeds. But they'd kept some of it back. And do you remember what Peter was given to say to Ananias? Ananias, he says, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Satan hath filled thine heart. It's not just a question of telling a lie. You see, when you're a Christian, it doesn't stop at that. It goes beyond it. Satan hath filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. What a terrible thing. And in order to show what a terrible thing it was, he was struck dead, you remember, at that very moment that God might there call attention to the early church and to its people and to all Christian people at all times and in all places to the very end of time. The terrible character of, of this particular sin. So you see that from our standpoint as Christians, uh, to lie uh, is to indicate that we have an affinity with the devil. And a liar, an habitual liar, is a man who belongs to the kingdom of the devil. His whole being is a lie. He's the father of lies. There is no truth in him. That is the very essence of sin. You see, there he is. He's the embodiment of it all. And that is what he teaches others to do. So says the apostle, in the light of all I've been teaching you. I've been reminding you, he says, of Christ dying for you and reconciling you to God. I've been telling you about the new life and the new nature, that you're new men and women, that you must put on the new man that is now in you. Why? Well, you must, and in this respect, first and foremost, stop lying and speak every man truth with his neighbor. Because if you don't, you're conveying the suggestion that you still are in the grip of the devil and that you belong to his kingdom. But that isn't true of us as Christians. As again the Apostle John puts it in his first epistle, he says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in the wicked one. That's where it is. And therefore its characteristic is this lying, this absence of truth. So, again, for that reason, the apostle, obviously, has to start with this particular injunction. You see, it's taking us back to the very foundations of our faith. I keep on saying this because it will help us not only with this injunction, but with all of them. We've got to learn to look at these things in a Christian way. We must think in a Christian way. And the moment you begin to think in a Christian way, it doesn't matter what the subject is, it'll take you back to the foundations of your faith. So when you tell a man to stop lying in the Christian church, you're doing something that's altogether different from the way it's normally done in the world, which is simply concerned about a facade and an appearance. You see, you can't do it in a Christian way without going back to your doctrine of God, back to your doctrine of the devil. Yes, and the next thing we come to is this. We must stop lying because the very first sin of men was the result of a lie. In other words, the world is this morning as it is because of a lie. Again, you see, back to a fundamental, foundational truth. Why is the world as it is? Well, the Apostle Paul, in writing his second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 11 and verse 3, puts it in these words, As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And you remember the account, you remember the story. 
What was the cause of that first sin? Well, it was the lie that the devil whispered to Eve. And the lie was a lie about the character and the being of God. Hath God said? Yes, God pretends that he is good to you and that he loves you and that he's out for your best interests, says the devil. But the actual truth is, said the liar and the father of lies, the actual truth is that he's against you and that he's keeping you down for his own interests because he knows that the day in which you eat of that fruit you will become as gods yourselves and you'll be equal with him and then you'll really have your rights. He's against you. That's the lie. Now that was the whole cause of the trouble. That was the thing that led to the fall. That, I say, was the thing that began the process that has led to the whole of human history as we know it, that is the thing that accounts for the state of the world this very morning. The original sin was produced by a lie. So you see the importance of starting with this particular injunction and the importance of asking questions of the scripture. Not just saying, oh, well, of course, lying is always wrong. Man must always be a man of his word. must always honor his bond, keep his curse. That's the world. The world says that. That isn't the Christian way of looking at this matter. We've got to realize that here we are looking at something that is a full representation of that which led to the original rebellion which led to the rebellion of the devil himself and then threw him to the rebellion of man. This is the thing that's brought the world down from being paradise to being the world in which you and I live at this moment. And it is as we thus look at it in this doctrinal way and see its fundamental nature and character that we can truly deal with it in a radical manner. But come, let's go on. As it was the uh, cause of the first sin, so I would say in the fifth place, that lying is the most prominent and the most common characteristic of the life of sin. There are many things that characterize the life of sin. But there is nothing that is so characteristic of the life of sin or is so commonly seen in the life of sin as lying. I take it that there's nobody who wants to dispute that proposition. You see, you commit a sin and you don't want to be found out and you don't want anybody to know it, so you tell a lie. Well, then because you've told that lie, you have to tell another to cover it and on and on it goes by a terrible, horrible process of geometric progression. It multiplies and multiplies and multiplies until the whole life becomes a a lie and a sham. Is there anything, I ask, which is more characteristic of the non-Christian sinful life as this element of lying? Deceit and lying, sham and pretense, I would say are more obvious in the life of the world this morning than anything else. Have you ever looked into that life of sin? Have you ever analyzed it? Look at a company of people, a group of people, on what is meant by the world to be some happy occasion, some reception or some party. Look at the affability and the friendliness. But then just watch the glances. Just listen to the whispering. Ah, oh, the camaraderie and the friendship and the affability. How delighted they are to me. And oh, how fond they are of one another. And they're muttering beneath their breath. Isn't that the life of society? What if people rarely spoke the truth to one another? 
and told one another what they rarely think of one another and what they rarely believe. Is it not obvious that the whole life of society in any realm or level, I don't care how polite it is, I don't care how exalted it is, it is run on this principle of deceit and of lying. And we all know it to be so. But the pretense goes on, the sham goes on, the play acting goes on. This is, I say, the most characteristic thing about the life of sin. And in the same way, is it not the greatest cause of the complications of life? Why does life become so involved and complicated? And so difficult. The answer is because of this element of lying. Because the moment we depart from the truth, as I say, that in itself has got to be covered by another and that by another. And so the whole life becomes such a complex and complicated. Sometimes we see this very plainly in an occasional criminal prosecution that is reported in the press. And you see how a man just starts by one mistake. It may have been a very small one and a very trivial one. Yes, but he's done it. It doesn't matter how small the thing was. It was wrong and he shouldn't have done it. Well, then because he's done that, he's got to cover it. And the whole thing develops and snowballs, as we say, until the poor man finds himself in a court on this tremendous charge. It was due to the original lie. And his life became involved and complicated. He had to cater for this and to cover that and to manipulate that thing and to be careful at this point. And so the whole of his life, which was meant to be simple and had been comparatively simple, becomes involved and he's juggling. He's got to keep it going somehow. And it's all due to a lie. Or can I put it to you like this? Is there anything, any single thing I wonder that causes so much unhappiness and misery in this world as lying. Again, we simply need to know life and the facts of life to know this. Lying and pretense and dissimulation and shamming. Oh, the unhappiness they cause. The suspicions they arouse the lack of ease and repose and quiet and the lack of trust. If only lying could be entirely banished, what loads would be lifted off minds and hearts this morning? Oh, the havoc that is caused by lying, the heartbreak, the sadness, the unhappiness, the suffering to innocent people that is caused by this Terrible thing, this lying that the Apostle tells us to put away at once, as the first thing we deal with. All right, let's go on to our sixth point. There is nothing, I say also, which shows us the real nature and character of sin, as lying does. What is, you think, the real essence of uh, sin? What's at the back of it? What's the cause of it? Oh, there can be no doubt about the answer to that question. Self. Self is the ultimate cause of sin. And it manifests itself in self-regard. Self-centeredness. And selfishness. Well, you say, what's all that got to do with lying? Oh, I can tell you. We express ourselves most profoundly in our speech. We express ourselves more in our speech than in anything else at all. It is the one thing, perhaps, of all things that differentiates men from the animal. The animal can express its nature in its behavior. You can have a quiet dog or a fierce, angry dog. Same with all other animals. But man has this unique capacity of speech. And it is, in a sense, his glory. 
There is nothing through which a person expresses his or her personality more profoundly than in speech. Very well then, put these two things together. This essential self and self-regard and self-centeredness and uh, selfishness. Well, what does that lead to? Well, uh, it leads to a desire to be highly thought of. It leads to a desire to be praised. It leads to a desire to impress people. It leads to a desire to be important. That's self, isn't it? We want everybody to think well of us. We want everybody to praise us. We want to be important. We want to cut a figure. Very well, then, how do we do this? Well, the way to do that in the world as it is in sin is to lie. Because the whole time you're building up this personality that you think you are and that you want to be, and that at any rate you want other people to think you are. You've got to build it up the whole time. Well, how do you do that? Well, you've got to be important, so sometimes you make deliberate misstatements. You invent facts. The anatomy of sin, the anatomy of lying... I'm dissecting this morning, and isn't it a foul and a horrible and a terrible thing? Well, why am I doing it? Well, in order that we may so see it that we'll put it away once and forever, as the Apostle is exhorting us to do. So, we make our deliberate misstatements and uh, inventions, or we may do it by, as I said, just saying nothing. We just uh, conceal the truth. We withhold the truth. And then another very common way. Exaggeration. You've got a story to tell, and it's quite a good story. But uh, you rather feel that if you embellish it a little, it'll be still more wonderful, it makes you still more So we exaggerate. And every time we tell this, we told it the first time, and it produced a good response. Ah, we thought that's good. We add a bit to it, and it's still better response. And on and on it goes. In the end... What we are now saying really has never happened at all. It's been so exaggerated, it's nothing but a lie. But the very first exaggeration was a lie. It wasn't factual. We added to it. But now why, why does mankind do this? Why exaggerate? Why add to things? Why withhold? Why fabricate? Why invent? Oh, you trace it out. You, you pick it up at any point in yourself or in anybody else. And we'll always find that it's just a minister to this self and this self-importance and the good opinion of others and uh, to be praised and to be highly thought of. So the whole time, I say, we are lying and building up this facade, putting on this camouflage, appearing to be something that in reality we are not. There is nothing, I say, that finally shows the real, horrible, base, foul character of sin. So much as lying, because speech is ultimately the supreme way of manifesting our personality. But let me go on to a seventh point, which is this one. Nothing shows more clearly the utterly despicable character of sin and of the nature of sin as lying. Now, what I mean is this. If you were to canvass the opinion of uh, any group of people you may like to meet and ask them, what do you think of a man who's a liar? Well, they'd be unanimous. There is nothing that human nature, even in sin, so despises in its judgments as a liar. We'll excuse a man many things, but a man who's a liar, we've no use for him. And the whole world is unanimous about that. There's nothing too bad to say about the man who is a liar. Now, the whole of mankind, I say, even fallen and debased and in sin, agrees about that. A liar is the most despicable kind of man. We all agree about that in theory. And yet, as I've been suggesting to you, though we all agree about that in theory, lying is the commonest of all sins. It's the most universal of all sins. 
There are many sins that many people do not commit. They commit other sins that the first group doesn't. But here is something that is common to the whole of men in sin. Though we hate it and despise it and denounce it, we are guilty of it because of this radical nature of sin, because it isn't merely a matter of actions on the surface. It's an expression of that which is the essential being and personality of a man since the fall. And it's all revolving around this self Oh, what a terribly deep thing sin is. How subtle. And that is where I must again denounce these mere moralities who treat them on the surface of life and say that you just apply a code and you just follow a fashion or you just put on a uniform as it were. No, no. This is a thing that comes out of the depths of a man's being. And what a hateful, foul, and terrible thing it is. There is nothing, I say, that shows what a terrible hold sin has upon human nature. Doesn't matter how refined, doesn't matter how cultured. Go up to the highest circles and you'll find it there. You'll find it everywhere. Gosh, the way in which it's done differs you can lie, as it were, with your horny hands of the sons of toil. But you can lie softly with kid gloves. The way it's done isn't the thing that matters. As it becomes more refined, it becomes more subtle and to me more hideous and hateful and foul. Because it's much more hypocritical the more refined it becomes. There is almost something to be said for the bare-faced liar rather than the one who so cleverly hides it and conceals it, but it's there. And thus I say lying shows more clearly perhaps than anything else the depth of sin, the hold and the power of sin. Though with our minds we despise the thing, we do it. And thus not only show that sin has made us contradictions and introduced this dualism and this false dichotomy into us, but it proves that we are slaves and serfs. And that brings me to my last point, which is this. The thing that the apostle picks out here, but which of course... I've been dealing with all along in my detailed analysis. There is nothing which is so opposed and so inimical to the doctrine of the church as lying. You see, at every point, lying leads us back to a fundamental doctrine, to a fundamental tenet of the Christian faith. Well, now, here it is. This whole chapter, as you know, we were considering it. The first section is entirely devoted to the doctrine of the church. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit called in one hope of your calling. It's like a body fitly joined and compacted together, all joined to the head and receiving the same supply. The body is one. Is there anything that is so destructive of that as lying? Lie not one to another, says the apostle, but speak every man truth with his neighbor, because we are members one of another. And I believe he was thinking particularly here about the church. There are those who think that he was thinking in a more general manner. I'm not persuaded of that. It's equally true in the general, but it is particularly true of the church. And here he's dealing with the whole thing in the context of the life of the church. We are all members one of another. Very well then, if you tell a lie to another member, you are really damaging yourself. You are lying in a sense sense to yourself. There is no such thing as an independent existence. No man liveth unto himself. No man dieth unto himself, says the apostle to the Romans. So that to lie to another member of the same body of Christ is to be lying to yourself. You're doing harm to yourself because you're doing harm to the body to which you belong. In other words, you can't say, well, now that finger of mine, well, that's just a finger. I can cut that. 
without myself doing any damage to myself. But you can't. You cut your finger, you will suffer. It isn't your finger that suffers, you suffer. The whole suffers. We are members one of another. Yes, but think of it like this. How can there be fellowship if there is lying? It's the exact opposite, isn't it? What makes fellowship possible is trust. Mutual trust. Mutual reliance. A feeling that you can trust one another. And therefore you can speak and speak freely and speak openly. But the moment the element of lying comes in, fellowship is destroyed. You're no longer free. You don't know how much you can believe or what you can believe. You don't know how much you can trust that other person. And fellowship has already gone. You're in a kind of police state in which everybody's spying on everybody else. You say, no, I wonder whether he really means that. I wonder whether that is really true. There's no fellowship at that point. You've destroyed it. Lying is destructive of fellowship. And what happens to us as Christians is not so much and not only that we are saved individually. We are all saved and made members together of the body of Christ. Or we are like a building that's going up, which is a habitation of God, and we're all individual stones in this wonderful building. But it's the unity of the building that matters. And this lying makes it impossible. It cuts at the very root of the whole doctrine of the Christian church at its most essential point. If you like, you can add to that the more general statement. The lawyer came to our Lord and said, Good Master, which is the first and the greatest of all the commandments? And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. That is the first and the chiefest commandment, and the second is like unto it. And what is that? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You don't believe in fooling yourself, do you? Well, then don't fool your neighbor. If you love him as yourself, you can't. You'll stop lying to him. You don't believe in lying to yourself? Well, don't lie to your neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. But when you're in the realm of the church and the redeemed, and when we say together, we were there, but we've been brought out and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, the washing of regeneration, the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Put away lying. Put it away. And speak every man truth unto his neighbor. Let it be known and obvious to everybody that we are no longer children of the devil. We are no longer children of darkness and of night and of the sham and the pretense and all that is so characteristic of the world with its diplomacy and its affability and its acting that nobody believes in. If I were a preacher of politics, I could illustrate this point admirably. I should imagine that nothing does such great harm to the relationship between nations as the exhibition of this very thing that I'm talking about. These statesmen, they write their memoirs after the war. Uh, during the war, we read about them all meeting together and how wonderfully well they were getting on together. Then they write their memoirs and give quotations from their diaries in which they tell us the things they were saying about one another secretly. How can you have trust while that sort of thing goes on? How can there be confidence when the whole thing is pretense and sham and acting and is based upon a central lie and dissimulation? It's wrong in the whole of life. It's what makes the world what it is this morning. But in Christian people, it should be unthinkable. We are the children of God, the children of light. We belong to the truth. We are the children of one of whom we can say, God, who cannot lie. And we are to be like our Father and to tell forth his praises, to manifest his virtues and his glories. And we do so by putting away lying and speaking truth one to another
and thereby proving that we are indeed new men and women and that we are brethren and children together of the living God. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.